Shalom and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamet in Highland Park, New Jersey, at the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shea Amen. And joining me, my good friends, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky on Shea Hesed of New York City, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Salman Schechter, Day School of Long Island. We are recording this on day 29, 209, 210. And we are dedicating, of course, our study to, to comfort and to the hostages and to Israel, to Klal Yisrael, this sense that uh, we are immersed in this very, very challenging time. Um, and we're thinking about them, especially after having concluded Pesach. Pesach, I want to put this out to, to both of you. Pesach concludes on on with with us in the diaspora here, eighth day, we, we have a Yisker. And I always find that the end of Pesach is, is um, somewhat uh, sad, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, which is just a very practical reason. It's the end of a holiday. Uh, two, congregational reason. You know, two days of Yantav, something's going to happen in the congregation. I had a, a person pass away in the congregation. That's that's always said. We have to kind of, you know, postpone a funeral till till after. Um, and three, of course, the main thing is that that there, there's a little gate that we go through at the end of uh, Pesach. And and I, I understand the the year is this, you know this is the imagery of of Jewish liturgy, share you know the the gates of of all the different holidays the gates of time and I I I, I love that image uh, because it it just makes so much sense we we come to Pesach we walk through a gate burning the chametz getting ready for the seder the seders the yom tov the cholamoid the shabbat cholamoid all the different moods, and then the end of, of Yontev with its readings and with its moods, and we enter the gates of Yisker, we exit the gates, and now it's there's a kind of emptiness. We, we you know, the Svarim, God bless the Moroccans, they, they, they know how to do this well. They, they, they just... I so wish, I so wish I was from, from, from Aleppo or, 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 it's not, it's not too late. It's not too late. It's too late for Aleppo. <laughs> we should explain what we're talking about. The Mamuna Festival. Of course, many of our readers, our, our viewers, listeners may come from this part of the world. We do not. Okay. And we envy. We have Sephardic envy. We have Moroccan oh. envy. Oh, because they have the Mamuna Festival. And they are just there. And Mamuna was about friends, their their neighbors. Just, you know, they understood that these people didn't eat anything, no cakes, no nothing for, for seven, eight days. And they just plastered with these things, plied with pancakes and sweet breads and all sweet, not bread, sweet, 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 <laughs> sweet, sweet stuff, sweet stuff, sweet milk, all things. And, and, and the truth is for Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim go, another meal. We have to eat another <laughs> meal. <laughs> it's a tuna for Shavuot. Right, but those but, yeah, the, the Maimuna is a joyful, a joyful you know way to close Pesach. Eighth day Pesach in Jerusalem, where when I was in Netanya a couple of years ago, I didn't I didn't appreciate just didn't, somebody didn't know the fact that Netanya is very 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 heavily Moroccan and Tunisian, and Maimuna was a big day there that that day. So we 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 do go into a different mode. We go out of the gate of Yisker. We 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 don't generally have Maimuna in our communities, um, but what we do have is the national calendar of the Jewish people. And and in just a few days from now, we are going to observe as communities and as a people Yom Hashoah, which was placed on the national calendar by the Knesset in Israel, uh, Yom Hashoah Vahagvura, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, which. Wait, wait, wait. Translate that, translate that a little bit more precisely. Holocaust remem remembrance and heroism. Or the, day, the day, the day, Yom HaShoah V'Hagivura, the day of catastrophe and heroism. And heroism. And, and I, uh, is is this correct that the, that the, that the Nissan-based date is somehow associated with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? Is that Indeed. true? I, I think the original date that they wanted was the second day of Pesach, which was the beginning of the revolt, and yeah. that was not going to fly, but because it's hard, yeah, yeah. And uh, but what strikes me is the significance of the date is that it's in most years it's in a different week than Yom Ha'atzmaut because it's eight days between them, 
And I think it's important theologically because I, I think too often people are trying to make a connection between the Holocaust and the state of Israel, which I think theologically is indefensible. So, I, so I, um, I, I personally, I, I once asked the great, great rabbi and great Holocaust theologian, Yitz Greenberg, if he felt that that the Holocaust, the Shoah, would be folded into a kind of mythic narrative. Like, you know, the, the destruction of the Chorban Beit HaMikdash, the destruction of the first temple, the second temple, also the first temple, you know, it's folded into mythic narratives. There's sinat chinam. There's there's social social hatred and dissension and pointless. And there's mivnei chata inu galinu meyatzenu. We were exiled because of our sins, and it's it's knit into a into a much bigger story than than an event. And and yet said, I certainly hope not. I hope it is never right. knit into. And and I do feel I I, I want to push back. I mean I understand, you know. And and this is this is well. Illustrated in the in the wonderful Tom Segev book called "The Seventh Million about Israelis and the Holocaust. I, I do understand that Israelis' stock in trade is we are tough. We would not go to the concentration camps. But Yom HaShoah is the story of six million dead and, and innumerable millions displaced. And Hagavura militarily is 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 a side story. The the inner Gavura, now that's significant. The inner Gavura. The inner heroism that enabled people to endure, I want to celebrate that. But I just the the whole the whole thing that kind of centers or foregrounds one of a small number of military rebellions just seems to me a false note. Like I think that the story of the Shoah is about the destruction of, of European Jewry and the inner resources of Am Yisrael that gave us the, the possibility to endure it and bounce back. Look, I, I think we can we can differ on the way we understand the word gvura. And I think to go in the direction that, that you might want to go into, which is that look, every day you survived was gvura. And 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 none of us, of course, can can totally comprehend what it took to survive. And we we, you know, as we enter these days, we can become quite immersed in in stories and narratives and and I'm sure we have we've all grown up and I, I still I still open myself to to um reading about the Shoah uh you know constantly. I, I've I've said in sermons and other teachings, you know, it's almost like th there's a there's a world here that that there's that almost every issue in the Shoah is like a masachet, a tractate on its own. And I once spent I, I don't know if you recall this, you know, one summer I was so I was so immersed in it, there was a big it was about 1200 page book on the Warsaw ghetto, all the scholarship in the Warsaw ghetto. And I don't know what, what drew me. I, I, I needed to read everything, every single thing about the Warsaw ghetto and including the maps, including, you know, the, the way that people organized and the way that they tried to, you know, just function on a daily basis. Um, and, and that constitutes uh, some gura. It constitutes, you know the 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 yearning to live. I would even add, for example, the the gvura of people after the Shoah, in the displaced yeah. Jewish person camps, who were the most. It's the, the highest fertility rate in the Jewish people in Jewish history, which is the um, the pent up desire for life. That these people found each other, they married, and they began having children. I have. A couple of you know many people in my shul who were born in DP camps um, and came to the United States in the late forties uh, after their parents picked up from their shattered lives and 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 reconstituted their their lives here um, and of course you know the, the the story of Israel no matter how you want to separate the two you really can't and I I'm I understand of course that the history of modern political Zionism is is goes back. A hundred years before the state of Israel, and of course, you know there there there's there's a an ample discussion and debate to have, but here here's where we're going, which is that the 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 Holocaust is the ur trauma of the Jewish people. There there's no trauma like it. You can't even compare the destruction of the temples, no matter how you know some elements of of our people would like to make. The destructions of the temples 
to be the 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 master catastrophe of the Jewish people. No, those 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 pale in comparison, just on in in scale to the destruction of European Jewry, um, and and to a certain extent, we, we, you know, here we are, eighty years afterwards, and we're still kind of trying to figure out how does this fit into the narrative. How does this fit into the liturgy? What do we do? I'll give you my example, and I want you to, you know, to to I'll test it out on you. Which is, you know, over the years in my show, we've been trying to do something where where we 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 create a liturgy around around this day. So, uh, as, as we move from Mincha to Mariv, uh, I have the ark, the light in the ark, t- turned off. We put it. We put. Uh, six memorial candles in there. We take all the Sifri Torah out of the Ark, and I explain to the congregation as we take the Sifri Torah the Ark, the Ark, one, this is a symbol of of the emptiness. There's nothing that's that could be more significant of 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 question, of difficulty, of anguish than seeing an empty Ark. It's also the efforts that Jews made to to sequester things, to hide, and and. We we can't recreate that. There's a certain kind of obscenity in reenacting things, but 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 here this we're only reaching for symbols. We 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 dove in, we we chant our prayers in a kind of without without festive melodies, and then we engage in the readings and uh, there there you know so many readings and testimonies, poetry, etc. We select every year, and then we um, we recite names of either people in our families, people that we're related to, survivors who uh, are no longer with us, which is another aspect of, of the holiday, the, the commemoration, uh, and communities, and and communities that we uh, come from. I, I am a descendant of the community of Antipol in Poland. I'm, I've never been there, of Kobrin, of Pinsk. These are places that are important in my imagination i've seen the maps i've read the books i've re, re, you know read the testimonies i'm immersed in that it's a part of my mythic life um and the people of course that were taken out of these shtetls and part of the ansatzgruppen and shot and buried in pits so this is this is part this is four three four generations you know before me and it's still like it's tactile in some way and it's tactile for many many people in my show and and we're we're coming close to it, and and so I I put that out there as a kind of ritual, and I say it's a failure. It's always going to be a failure because nothing can really encapsulate it. So I, I want to go in a slightly different direction. I don't know that it's a failure. I think that you know what happens sometimes is that we're not really used to watching history unfold. We're used to it being settled, and you know we have this idea which is encouraged by our tradition, of course, that our tefillot, our prayers, and our prayer services sort of came almost deus ex machina from Mount Sinai, even though historically it's a result of hundreds of years of people doing things that finally crystallize in the services that we know. And you know what will be interesting, and we probably will not live to see it, is that and I suspect in the next 50 years, things will crystallize and that there may become a liturgy or a few liturgies that will become adopted by a number of different communities. Right now, it's kind of every community for itself because people don't quite know what to do. But I think things will, will settle in some way and certain things will become meaningful for larger groups of people. And other things will will fall by the wayside. You know, it's interesting to just think of our liturgy for a moment. So there are the Amidah concludes with a blessing for peace, which has a morning version and an evening version, because there were two different traditions. And so one was given to the morning and one was given to the evening. And something like that may happen with a Yom HaShoah liturgy, that some communities will adopt some things, other communities will adopt other things, but that a liturgy itself will finally crystallize and come into being. I'm pretty skeptical about that latter point. Oddly enough, how, how did it happen? It's kind of, a, you know, we know the fact that it didn't come deus ex machina out of Sinai. And yet, in an ancient eras, when they did not have very effective means of communication among far-flung communities, 
liturgy, even though there's a difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi, there's a difference between, you know, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Iran, you know, the Iran liturgy and the Morocco liturgy and the and the France liturgy could could differ. They actually they had a they're remarkably stable. And here in an era where we have incredible electronic communications, there's just a great profusion of difference. I'm a little skeptical that people, because of the diversity of communities and the lack of the lack of centralized authority, I think that they will continue to be diverse. People will pick different poems and stuff, and and they will. will but clearly, one of the things that I think is going to be very different than than X many years ago is, and it's, it's the great challenge. First of all, I thought what you said was beautiful. The the, the scene of the empty ark um, is the great challenge of memorializing the Shoah in the absence of actual survivors, and we are within you know five years or something like that of of never having any actual survivors to know and it's it's pretty it's pretty incredible i mean um it's it's hard to imagine for uh, for us who are as you said you know three four generations from from our the european towns that our ancestors came from knowing shoah survivors and knowing their stories you know firsthand is just very very central to us being jews and the need for us to mark it liturgically with the Tzvira in Israel, the uh, siren, and the various kinds of poems and prayers that we that we recite, uh, I, I I just I think that gives it a kind of depth that it would lack otherwise, and it has to be communal. It can't just be I personally sit and, and read my primo levi, although that's meaningful too. It has to be that we as a group get together and do this. Um, uh, I, I mean, we can. I can throw in a poem later, but uh, um, as you think about thinking about, as you talk about thinking about the uh, the liturgical or or ritual markers. You know, our our listeners will will certainly know that uh, on on Tisha B'Av, you don't put on tefillin until the afternoon. It's like the Hishlich Mishamayim Eretz Tiferet Yisrael, the 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 glory of Israel was thrown to the ground, and so. To fill in our, the are considered a pair, some sort of beauty, and and so they get displaced from the morning service. Rabbinic Jews couldn't say we wouldn't put them on at all that day. That would be bitul mitzvah to say that that would be just ignoring a mitzvah. So we displaced them until later in the day. There was a spot in my life. It just I it didn't really. I I said I'm not wearing to fill in on Yom Hashoah. And I'm fasting, and even though fasting is counterindicated because it's in the month of Nisan, you're not supposed to fast in Nisan. I said I'm going to fast on Yom Hashoah, and I'm not going to wear tefillin, and it just didn't work because I was the only person behaving in that way. And and you can't you can't have a ritual that's personal idiosyncrasy. Um, but you know, and also fasting is kind of funny because people had real hunger. What if I skip breakfast one day? That's going to be like I'm somehow connecting with their experience that's like a joke but um one year there's a guy in my show his father was in Auschwitz his father was uh was uh you know sent on a work detail and he, one year in the show he related the story that his father found a raw potato in the field and he ate that potato raw and he said it was the best thing he ever had in his life and I, I said okay that's it I'm gonna do that I'm gonna eat a raw potato it was so gross it was so disgusting. I, I couldn't keep up. I couldn't right. keep up that that ritual either. I, I just let me react here, which is which is your your desire to to create a ritual is a desire of a of a of a symbolic reenactment of something, and 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 I think we can we can relate to that in 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 many many different ways. Look, my the 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 thing that I proposed there was. I, I even, you know, said it's a it's like a a kind of minuscule micro reenactment. Of 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 things that are beyond comprehension and the sense of terror that people people had, and and so you know, in a sense, we we come to these days with with tremendous quandary, tremendous puzzle, without without a canon, really, and and you know, here we have to you know, noticing that we don't have the canon, you know, complete of testimonies and poetry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, liturgy. Um, we're 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 kind of lost, you know. And in a way, it's look look. We we have a canon 
from when 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 the people of Israel went into its first exile, uh, we have you know that's where the Bible comes from. The Bible comes from the necessity to create the library that will tell over the story of its of the people and its origins and preserve its its uh, its existence. And and we we have the museums and we have the narratives. We have the we just you know there there we haven't gotten the Sanhedrin together and say this is in this is out Eli Wiesel is in Primo Levi's in and and who knows whatever is is out you know and 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 because that's kind of absurd it's just it's just a, a lot it's an endless endless source of material and it's an endless uh, source of things to study with with your permission I I, I do want to raise this question which means which is really the 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 big question for this year this year this year the these days are really hard um because these days now are part of a larger context in terms of you know today we're now 209 210 days into the the war we are still uh in in a sense um fractured broken from october the 7th i think the you know the healing is is not even a a, a word that you can use even though there are indications the process there there there's the possibilities that that people are at least attempting or trying in some ways you know putting back that you you i hear you know podcasters talk about i was in tel aviv and it's bustling and things are happening there and it, you know on the one hand you would never know on the other hand that's what everybody's talking about so there's there's a kind of split screen here there's there but but what what i'm saying is that the the October seventh language, which also includes things like the worst catastrophe since the Shoah to happen to a, the Jewish people in a single day, that's one. And you know, you hear Yossi Klein Alevi say this was a, a prequel of the genocidal ambition. And so, what that does is it awakens this kind of trauma, this ur trauma of the Jewish people that that. The whole Jewish people is thrown into this national PTSD of of having experienced near uh, extermination eighty years ago in the Holocaust. We had a kind of glimpse of an attempt at extermination, and that that has has rattled us and shaken us to places that we 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 really can't fathom and and are trying to recover from and it's it's that serious we take it that seriously and and so therefore i i i put out to you you know how do you react to these this language and how do you react to the question what does it mean this year so i'm going to turn to you jeremy first pulpit rabbi honor enough for a lifetime uh i um one of my favorite lines about the Shoah is, is in the in Faith After Faith After the Holocaust by Eliezer Berkovich. It says, "Those of us who were not there, we are all Job's younger brother," which I think is an amazing line. People we love experience something we cannot even begin to put into words, um, and so I, this is this is feeling kind of present to me that the, the the simultaneity of of being a close witness and not an immediate participant and being being inaccessible um to our words I, I i don't that's maybe kind of what it is to be an american american jew who loves israel who's not a citizen i feel like i feel like you know i'm, I'm the younger brother um a relative or or you know we're we're kind of lost too we're, we're we're trying to to figure out this relationship we're trying to you know uh emote in solidarity or or in the mortal words of the great canadian poem poet irving layton we we ache in confraternity we are aching in confraternity um and and um but aching in confraternity is not aching in and being there and 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 this, I mean, that's a, a, a separate conversation in terms of what what 
how this relationship is is moving through its different gates, as it were, uh, through this year as well. Um, I, you know, Barry, I don't know if you have any reflections on 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 just language and and how we use language to describe catastrophe and and the cautious way that we might want to use language or the deliberate way that the so I, I think that we want to distinguish between two kinds of language one is the language of words and the other is the language of symbols and one of the curiosities of pesach is of all of our holidays it's the one that has the most symbolic meanings to it right we identify the salt water with tears of a slave the charoset with mortar for bricks. But, you know, when we start to think about it, they don't actually encapsulate what we want them to on one hand. But on the other hand, they still speak powerfully to us, even without the words. Right? We have a, we identify in a certain way to the best that we can, even though we realize that the identification itself falls short. So one of the things that struck me this year in one of the Haggadahs I was using is a description of Pesach in one of the camps where they made a bracha about how they wanted to have matzah this year, but they couldn't. But they still had to have Pesach. And I think that sometimes we... So they made a bracha on chametz, right? Yeah. We don't give ourselves enough credit for adapting to the circumstances and the situations that we're in, but the tradition that we've inherited and that we fashion day by day and hope to bequeath to our children and grandchildren has a lot of resources in it that a time like this might bring to the surface. And you know, yeah, go on. No, I was going to say, you know, it reminded me of, of the passage in the Haggadah. And there was a reading in one of our our um, supplements. I think the the May Schechter supplement they produced. Um, they had a poem that that kind of had different layers of behold over dor chayav adam that small. Every generation of person has to see him herself as, and they they put different kind of emotional valences. It was very effective in the sense that that there are different modes to this. You know, you have to see yourself as if you left Egypt. You know. Do you have, you know, do you have to see yourself as if you left Auschwitz? I think that's a very, you know, we, we can't make that leap, but we can we see ourselves as being deprived? Can we see ourselves as, can we see our, can you see yourself as a, as a hostage? I can't, I can't imagine what this is. You know, well, I, what would be the value of trying to imagine that? I want to, I listen to Rachel Goldberg, Paul, and I listen to John and I, Paul, and, and I, and I'm going like, I I so feel the sympathy for them as well as the the you know the other families. They're not as well known to us, but these speak to us in English. They speak to the American audience and to the world audience, and and we latch on to them in sympathy. Right, but sympathy is not their, empathy. Their love, what is our love? They're, it's our family. It's us. Right, but sympathy is not empathy, and I think that empathy makes the direct connection, which I don't think that we can make. Yeah. And that's why we're left with sympathy, where we remain on the outside, but we extend our comfort and consolation as best we are able. But we can't yeah. really, as you say, imagine what it's like to be a hostage. And we can't even really imagine what it's like to be the family of the hostage. I but think that this is, I think, yeah, I think you're yeah, really, go ahead. Onto I think you're onto something very significant. Um, the, uh, the, the limits of imagination it it would be obscene to see, like you you can't say every person is bound to see themselves if they if they personally went out of Auschwitz that would be obscene because it would be appropriating an experience that blessedly we haven't had and the people who have had it um it would be cheapening it and uh professor Alibni writes in his holocaust memoir you know that he is very, very close with his grandfather, Professor David Weiss Halevni Zechat Tzadik Libracha. And they got to Auschwitz and they and Mengele pointed them in whatever way. Halevni was 14 or 15 year old at the time. His grandfather was very aged. And he, Halevni just said, 
I'm going the other way. Well, whatever's going that way, I'm going the other way. And and I was last he saw his grandfather who went into the chambers and was dead in, in, in 20 minutes. Um, and, and he writes in his memoir, I was we were separated on the train platform. I will not arrogate to myself the the attempt to imagine something I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine the experience in, in, in the gas chamber. I wasn't there and I will not cheapen it by trying to imagine it. And that seems to me very vivid. It seems to be vivid for this moment too. Um, when I was in Israel in November, we met this woman, Ayelet Shachar, who, whose name appeared in the paper today, New York Times today, because Brett Stevens wrote about Sheryl Sandberg's movie about the sexual violence. And Ayelet Shachar is the mother of Naama Levy, who was one of the faces that you recognize on the on the hostage posters and who was uh, like, she was this terrible, terrible, you know, little clip of her being dragged by the ponytail through the streets of Aza with like bloody sweatpants. And you can only assume, you know, the, the terrible abuse she suffered. And I, I, I met her in November. She was so articulate. I can't even conceive of what she's been through since then. And I can't, and, and even she can't even see what her daughter's been through since then. It's the li the limitations of imagination that that just very feel very present. And I think we should probably try to incorporate the consciousness of those limitations whenever we think about these terrible, terrible events, present time and time minus eighty years. Right. And so what we're left with is the traditional way that we comfort someone, which is by showing up and not speaking. Because yes. the language of presence is more important than words which seem empty. So you do you do need some kind of liturgy then. You do need some kind of vocabulary. That comes in time though. That doesn't come right away. So we, we you know we have the you know, the words of the tradition is you can't comfort someone whose dead has not been buried yet. Oh, understood. So we see Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I think and I think one more thing which is I'm, I'm hankering to read this poem, but it's okay. I'm gonna let it go. But in 1943, Abraham Shlonsky was a leading leading poet in in Israel, pre-state Israel. And the poem is called Neder, and the key thing is, I make this vow to remember everything and forget nothing, and not to go back to normal, um, not to go back to normal tomorrow morning, having learned absolutely nothing yet again. And so I do think that that is not that kind of imaginative response is not, um, you know, chayav adam lirot tatzmoki ilu hu nitzol shoah that like a person is 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 bound to consider themselves as Holocaust survivors that would be obscene, or October seventh survivors that would be obscene, but it is to say that our society can't be the same as it was before. And that's a vow that I think that we all all should be able to make uh, that we're we're not going to just go back to normal. Right. I think that's a, a very important point. But I want to add one other thing. Uh, the reason why we have to imagine that we left Egypt is because we identify that with the saving power of God. We don't identify the other things that we've mentioned with the saving power of God. And that's why we don't imagine ourselves in those situations. We don't imagine being slaves, really. We imagine coming out of Egypt. Those are two different experiences. And I think that part of the limitations that you were talking about, Jeremy, are also limitations on the way that we relate to God. And God, in a certain sense, cannot be everywhere anymore the way he possibly was for our ancestors. I mean, I wonder, places, I wonder, there are places in the world where God is not present. I think that that's the conundrum. I mean, we, we've we've come to the end here, but but it's Hester, it's Hester Panim. This is the conundrum, Kanim, Kanim. Shah, which is which is you you you're trying to evoke and create a liturgy in a in a in in the darkest darkest abyss, or you know, it's the theological black hole, and and nothing can come out of it. That that. And it's 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 the region, it's the zone of blackness. I mean, we have in my shul we have these these windows that depict Jewish history, and for the Shoah we have just one black pane because it's mm -hmm. impossible. There's no light. It's it's just one one darkness. 
On the other hand, okay, so as I mentioned, you know, I have libraries and libraries and libraries of things, and we can't stop talking about it. I can't stop reading about it. I mean, can't stop framing our our own understanding of the world without without you know thinking about it. So, so we we need to end on some element of hope. And one of the things I I think is important to remember is that in our lifetime we've seen the way that the Holocaust is remembered and memorialized changed. In the early days, it was about destruction. The early books, you know, Rawl Holberg's The Destruction of East European Jewry. But now a lot of museums are more concerned with the lives that were led before the Holocaust. And the and it's important to remember that, that the people who died were actually living human beings just like us. You know, they had families, they had loves, they had losses. And that's what we need to incorporate into our lives. Not just the way that they left this world, but the world that they tried to create in their daily lives. Yeah, again, it's uh, it's an endless conversation. Um, and And of course, that's, that's one one avenue into it is to to see the the sanctification of life and to to remember them as they lived and not only as uh, in the way that they were they were killed um, and persecuted. Um, so we enter these these gates now through this week ending Pesach, and you know with with Klal Yisrael with the entire Jewish people going from this moment to Yom HaShoah and, and beyond uh, in a very, very challenging year. And hoping that uh, our viewers and listeners uh, have gotten some meaning out of this conversation. We thank you for joining us as always. We appreciate your presence with us. And we look forward to having this conversation with you on the next edition of Parsha Talk. Have a wonderful Shabbat, everyone. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom.